flying or you, you work from home? No, so we we are back. Uh, we are back uh, at the university. Uh, the problem is that I had COVID at the beginning of January, but no symptoms really. Uh, all fine, also because I had vaccine, and so I recovered after five days. Everything was fine. Yesterday was was totally fine. This morning I woke up with headache, nausea, dizziness, uh, it's like labyrinthitis. And so I was in the morning in the bed, just not able to stand up. Now I'm getting better. So now I'm able to deliver the talk, but I'm, I'm, I'm at home. That's, that's, that's to answer your question. Today I'm at home. It's just me that I'm not feeling very well. But the rest, no, we are back to normal. And the UK now is uh, pretty much back to normal. No more, um, uh, no more, uh, we don't have the need to wear masks uh, outside or inside. So they just removed that. We don't need testing to travel out and back into the UK, no more testing. So. Kind of back to normal, fortunately, also because this Omicron variant, everyone got it really. So I think now only very small percentage is, uh, is uh, without antibodies at this point. So, yeah. <laughs> you guys have heard Professor Otat's phrase. He said, uh, everyone gets Omicron. If you haven't, you need to work on it. <laughs> <That's what laughs> Also, Pietro, yeah. I think uh, the, the feeling of nausea and headache, well, I would say uh, COVID is not the only source. When my grant was rejected last week, I had the same feeling. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> you Possible. have nothing to do with COVID. <laughs> There's no vaccine against that, son. No, that's... <laughs> no vaccine. Yeah, hi, Luder. It's great seeing you too, Luder. Hi, uh, Luder. Hi, how are you? you. Good to see you. Good to see you, good to see you. Wonderful. So, so maybe we get started. Uh, it, the Pietro's talk, Professor Modestri's talk, uh, I already told students a little bit about you. Uh, uh, Kimberly will give a more detailed intro, but I would say that uh, Pietro is a very much recognized international leader in surgical robotics. He, uh, I'm very glad he could talk to us today uh, and uh, uh, right now he's based in UK. Uh, you will uh, hear from Kimberly. He was all over the place uh, in the past uh, a little while. But uh, uh, to tell uh, the speaker, this is a mix of uh, a class with uh, graduate students and uh, and uh, uh, master PhD stu students and master students, but also uh, uh, audience from the Robotics Institute who are not part of the course. But here, everybody's interested in robotics. So without okay. further ado, uh, Kimberly, you can go ahead. Yes, yeah. welcome. Um... Pietro, thank you so much for being here on behalf of the Robotics Institute, particularly on a day when you weren't feeling so well. We really appreciate it. Um, so Pietro Valdestri joins us. Uh, he is the Chair in Robotics and Autonomous Systems at the University of Leeds, where he also directs the STORM Lab. Uh, he, he does have quite an international background. He studied at the University of Pisa and got his PhD from Scuola Superior Santa Ana. He was an assistant professor at Vanderbilt University before he moved to Leeds in 2016. Uh, he co-founded the medical startup Win Medical. He's won a litany of awards, so please look at his bio to see that full list, um, including the NSF Career Award. Um, and his research has been featured by several tech magazines, including the BBC, the Financial Times, the Spectator, Wired, and a whole host of others. And we're so grateful and excited for him to join us. Welcome, Pietro. Please take it away. Yeah, thank you for the nice introduction. I will now share my screen. Uh, share. OK, can you see the screen? Yes, OK, very good. All right, so it's really a pleasure to, to talk to you about my research. Uh, so today I'm going through um, 
standard uh, uh, research seminar showing you what I am, uh, what we are doing in, in, in my lab. Um, and in particular, um, in the last year, we have been focused on um, surgical robots and voluminal robots for early detection and treatment of cancer. So in my career, I started from a broad robotic uh, research background. Uh, then I narrowed it down to medical application, then uh, surgical and endoscopic application. And now I'm narrowing it uh, down further to cancer. So it's, it's every, every researcher, I guess, has his, his or her own uh, path uh, during uh, the career. And for me, this path has been uh, from a broad start to a very narrow uh, current state. So where I'm extremely focused uh, on, uh, on uh, detection and treatment of cancer. Um, and I mean, this is of course a personal, a personal uh, uh, option uh, and this is mine just to, and we can discuss this more uh, at a later stage. Um, okay, so let's start. Uh, where is, uh, where, where am I? So I'm in Leeds. Uh, Leeds, uh, not to be uh, mixed with Linz, which Linz is in Austria. Leeds is in the UK and it's in the uh, middle of the UK, um, which here in England, they say it's in the north of England because England is this area here below Scotland. So Leeds is in the north of England, but to me, it's in the center of the United Kingdom. Anyway, it's two hours from London by train, just to give you a rough estimation of where we are. Leeds is in the center of Yorkshire. Yorkshire is a beautiful region with very nice uh, countryside. Uh, so if you, um, if you stop by the UK, Okay, I definitely suggest you to visit Yorkshire. It's beautiful, really beautiful. In terms of research, uh, what I really like about Leeds is that it's a very um, big and well-renowned university. So a lot of opportunity for research. They recently built us a new uh, space for uh, robotic engineering. And I have these four windows here at the top floor of this building with a nice view on the city center. Uh, here we have uh, now an electromagnetic coil for our magnetic robots. So it's a very, very nice place to do research, I have to say. Um, and also one reason why I'm in Leeds is that it has one of the biggest research hospital in Europe. Uh, it's a research intensive hospital, a lot of collaborators uh, uh, in the field and especially uh, in cancer. And Leeds is launching this Friday, a new cancer research center uh, of which I'm, I'm going to be the deputy director. Uh, and so it's a very exciting time now to do technological research for cancer detection and treatment in Leeds. Um, so I'm really excited about this uh, opportunity. Now, I will start my seminar by highlighting uh, a recent uh, paper I had uh, the chance to contribute. Uh, and it's a sort of very nice uh, overview of the field of medical robotics in the last decade. This has been published in Science Robotics a few months ago, uh, and it embraces different uh, um, application of medical robotics from rehabilitation robotics, prosthetics, uh, down to um, capsule robots uh, and continuum robots for endoluminal application, as well as, of course, soft robots. So if you are interested in medical robotics in general or in one of these specific disciplines, I definitely recommend you to uh, have a look at this uh, paper. I personally curated the chapter about capsule robots. But what is important for my talk today is that this paper um, builds upon uh, a distinction of levels of autonomy in medical robotics. So as you may be aware, now autonomy is pervasive in the field of robotics, uh, started from automotive, autonomous car, uh, with different level of autonomy from uh, uh, parking assistance to autonomous driving. Um, 
an editorial in Science Robotics in 2017 uh, tried to apply the same level of automation to surgical, uh, to medical robotics. This recent review paper elaborates on that, uh, providing more details on these, these various level and an update on, uh, on which application they are more uh, pertinent to. And in particular, there, are, there is no autonomy like uh, the Da Vinci robot from Intuitive, which is transparently mapping the user intent onto the surgical instrument. And then there is robot assistance, for example, virtual fixture or the limitation of areas where the surgical instrument should not go to prevent damaging the patient. Task autonomy, for example, autonomous suturing, a recent paper from John Hopkins just came out on Science Robotics this month uh, from the group of Axel Krieger showing uh, um, autonomous suturing in um, minimal invasive surgery, and then up up conditional autonomy, autonomy to full automation. And so keep this distinction in mind because especially in the field of robotic colonoscopy, my lab has been explored this different level and I'll come back to uh, this uh, in a few minutes. Um, but now let's, let's get into the detail of our activities. So my lab is called STORM Lab, when STORM stands for Science and Technologies of Robotics in Medicine. And uh, <clears throat> we have uh, a very preeminent activity in the field of robotic endoscopy, in particular uh, um, robotic colonoscopy uh, by using magnetic, intelligent magnetic manipulation. Um, we are also developing uh, ultra low cost uh, um, uh, design for uh, um, cancer screening in rural areas of low income countries. Um, we also work in the field of uh, robotic surgery. We have a DVRK, Da Vinci Research Kit, uh, and we use it to uh, explore different level of uh, automation. In particular, um, we, have, we are trying to automate tissue retraction during uh, laparoscopic surgery. And we are also interested in exploring uh, uh, different imaging modalities like uh, micro ultrasound and terahertz. Uh, to um, augment uh, robotic surgery. And last but not least, uh, we are developing uh, uh, personalized magnetic tentacles to reach deeper inside the human anatomy via endoluminal approaches. And so the, the, the largest part of my talk will focus on robotic colonoscopy and magnetic tentacles. And then I'll briefly uh, touch also on these other two uh, topics of, of research. Um, and I'll be glad to expand uh, in, in the, in the Q&A session. But now let's first start from uh, robotic colonoscopy. Uh, let me say that this research area is something I'll be working in for the last 15 years now. Uh, so you will, you will see a very developed body of research. Uh, we are hoping to sell all our technology and licensing it to, to a large corporate in the next few months. So fingers crossed that is uh, going to happen. Um, and we certainly would like to see this in patients in the next three years or so. Um, now, why colorectal cancer? Uh, so colorectal cancer is cancer in the colon. The colon is the last part of the gastrointestinal tract. So this part here. Um, the, col the, the cancer that develops there is a type of cancer that progresses uh, in uh, five stages in five to 10 years. Um, and if it is detected as an early stage, stage zero, stage one, or even stage two, it can, and it can be removed uh, very efficiently via um, colonoscopy, and uh, it won't come back again. In the same spot, at least in the same spot. If the cancer is detected at a later stage, when it becomes symptomatic, so uh, blood in the feces uh, and abdominal pain, if detected at this late stage, then the five year survival rate, so the chance to be still alive after five years from diagnosis, is just 11%. Um, 
And so it's extremely important to detect a cancer at an early stage when it can be removed via polypectomy. And you see with very high five-year survival rate and avoid to the cancer to progress to this stage. And at, at that point, you can only do surgery. So removing part of the colon, chemotherapy and radiotherapy uh, with very poor, very scarce outcomes. So early detection is crucial. What is the best way for an early detection? The best way for an early detection and treatment at the same time is via colonoscopy. So colonoscopy uh, is a procedure that uses a colonoscope, which is a type of flexible endoscope. And the colon colonoscope is a 1.5 meter long tube, uh, not that not very flexible. It is of course flexible, but it's not very flexible. Uh, it's about uh, 1.5 uh, centimeter in uh, diameter. It has a camera at the tip, uh, a nozzle for cleaning the camera and uh, uh, insufflating gas to expand the lumen to allow vision, um, light to illuminate, uh, an instrument channel, and also it has cable running through the length of the device to articulate the tip. So. Uh, the user interface looks like this. And with the thumb, the user can control two different knobs. And one knob is for moving the tip left, right, and the other one up, down. So it has two uh, degrees of freedom at the tip. Um, I was mentioning the instrument channel. The instrument channel can be used to pass endoscopic instruments. For example, this is a biopsy uh, forceps to get tissue sample for uh, uh, histological analysis. And this is a polypectomy loop. So if, if a polyp, a precursor of colorectal cancer is located, this is visualized, then the, the, the gastroenterologist can use a polypectomy loop to cut the polyp and take it out. Um, and so, as I was mentioning before, if the polyp is at an early stage, then this, this solves the problem once and for all. So this is the instrument. This is a very effective instrument, uh, um, but it has very, very big limitations. Uh, and those limitations are due to the design. And so as you can see here, the, the, the design didn't really evolve that much from 1957 when flexible endoscope was introduced to um, 2021, so to, to this year, really, I have to update this in 2022 now. Uh, so the main uh, progress happened in, in the imaging uh, part. So in 1957, uh, this was a bundle of optical fibers. So the, the doctor was looking into the ocular here to see uh, the image coming from the tip. Now we have chip on tip cameras, which are ultra HD, uh, can be uh, different uh, type of illumination can be used. So we can have narrow band imaging. Uh, so imaging has really progressed, but the design of the device is still the same, still a uh, pretty rigid tube that is articulated at the tip. Um, and so basically what is the downside? Downside is that the instrument is still introduced from the back. And in order to advance in a convoluted anatomy like the colon, it must interact with the, uh, with the anatomy. And stretching the colon generates a lot of pain. Uh, it, can, it can lead to perforations. Uh, and so it's very, very inconvenient. Uh, it's so painful that most of the procedures are, are performed under deep sedation. And deep, deep sedation increased the risks for a colonoscopy because deep sedation happened by getting very powerful drugs. And sometimes there are cardiovascular complications to that. <laughs> Another disadvantage is that the user interface is highly unintuitive because uh, the user is controlling uh, the um, articulation of the tip and the motion of the camera by two knobs with a single finger. Uh, very inconvenient, very, very also unintuitive. So a long learning curve for gastroenterologists to be proficient with colonoscopy <clears throat> and also a big disparity in outcomes. 
So there are extremely skilled gastroenterologists which have a very high adenoma detection rate. So the rate, the number of, of lesions that are detected, but there are other gastroenterologists that are not as skilled. So their adenoma detection rate is extremely low. And so there is a high chance that who is getting a colonoscopy done by these operators that some lesions may be missed. And so cancer can come anyway, despite having got the right colonoscopy at the right time. So a big disparity in, in outcomes due to how difficult the procedure is. And then the instrument itself is extremely expensive. So it's, it is composed by a lot of complicated uh, uh, parts. And so the cost of one instrument like this is about uh, <coughs> Uh, 40 to 60 thousand dollars and so it, it, it must be reused to make a business case for the hospital uh, and that means that the hospital need or the center administering colonoscopy need to have the right facility to reprocess a scope uh, and uh, and this make colonoscopy only available in specialized centers it would be of course extremely nice to have a platform a, 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 a robot, a system, a technology that can be administered outside an hospital by personnel that is not, uh, that doesn't require a very long training, and in particular, a technology that would be painless. This would increase the, 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 the number uh, um, of patients being screened for colorectal cancer in time and ultimately, hopefully, save lives. <coughs> So there have been some substantial research in the field of robotic colonoscope. Um, this is a nice paper from Gastone Schutti uh, in Italy, um, who is um, providing a review of, of the field. So in, in our case today, I'll speak about uh, um, our magnetic flexible endoscope. It is interesting to note that out of all these technologies, there are there is only one that is available, FDA approved and available in hospital, which is this soft snake robot that works on an inchworm locomotion approach. <clears throat> this is developed by an Italian company called Endotics, spin out of Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna, um, and is now active for the, the last 20 years, I think. They are not, um, their system is, is, yeah, as I said, FDA approved and C mark, so available, but is, is not replacing colonoscopy. My uh, impression is that the downside of their technology is that is, is it takes quite a considerable time to navigate the entire colon, while the technology to replace colonoscopy need to be as fast as a colonoscopy. Um, and typically colonoscopy is about five minutes to get to the end or to the end of the cecum. And I think this one here takes about 30 minutes. Okay, so this is the platform that we have developed. So uh, we, dev we started with the idea of magnetic manipulation of the tip of the endoscope back in 2008-2009, where I was still at Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna. It was a European project called Vector. And at that time, we had the idea of, instead of pushing a rigid uh, tube uh, from the distal end, why don't we apply force and torque when, where is really needed, so at the tip? of the flexible endoscope by embedding a permanent magnet at the tip and using a permanent magnet on the outside connected to a robotic arm. And then apart from, from the mechanical side of it, all the other instruments are the same of a flexible endoscope. So there is a, um, a camera, an instrument channel, an irrigation nozzle, illuminations, so all the same things. Um, and so basically, and here you see a demonstration of us introducing a biopsy grasper. And here you see the flexibility. Uh, so since we don't have to push it from the back and we don't need Bowden cables for steering the tip, then the body of the device can be extremely flexible. 
<laughs> and so our hypothesis here is that uh, now since we are applying force and torques at the tip and we are not pushing uh, a very rigid instrument inside the body anymore, we hope this solution could be extremely painless. And then thanks to robotics, we can make it as intuitive as driving a car in a video game. And we can make this design extremely low cost because uh, uh, again, we don't have board and cables, which was one of the most expensive component. <laughs> and so here the main item of cost really is the camera because otherwise there is a magnet and plastic. And so the idea is to make this disposable. <clears throat> and so the entire colonoscopy procedure to be available outside an hospital setting. <clears throat> so this was the original idea. Then uh, we did a comparative study. Uh, this was again back in 2011, 2012. We did a comparative study of uh, this approach against colonoscopy. And so at the time we were uh, controlling with the joystick the end effector of the robot by looking at the image coming from the tip of the endoscope. And so here the assumption was that if the colon was appropriately insufflated, <coughs> which was the case because we had uh, the possibility to insufflate, the tip of the magnetic endoscope was able to follow the motion of the external magnet. So by controlling the external magnet on, on top of, of uh, the desired trajectory, then we were able to complete a colonoscopy. But of course, we didn't have a direct view of the flexible endoscope because in, in a clinical practice, uh, the flexible endoscope is inside the patient and the patient is not, uh, notoriously not transparent. And so when we compared this to uh, conventional colonoscopy, we found that navigation and diagnostic accuracy, so navigation in terms of reaching the end of the colon <clears throat> and diagnostic accuracy in terms of finding uh, lesions that were randomly placed was comparable, but the time to complete a robotic procedure was three times slower. And the reason was that uh, uh, very often the magnetic coupling was lost due to the fact that, <clears throat> for example, the cable was um, ampering the motion of the tip. And so the user was still controlling the external magnet up to the point where there was no magnetic coupling. Then the user had to understand that the magnetic coupling was lost just by looking at the images and then go back with the external magnet, try to re-engage the tip and try a different, uh, a different path. <laughs> so this was extremely time consuming and frustrating, of course. And so we decided to uh, invest our time and efforts in developing a real-time localization technique for the tip of the endoscope. And so we placed the number of magnetic field sensors inside the tip of the flexible endoscope plus an accelerometer. And uh, we uh, measured the magnetic field generated by the external magnet at the tip of the endoscope. We rotate this vector thanks to the accelerometer. And then we do a search in a pre-calculated magnetic field map to find the, the, the position or the orientation of the tip that would experience that reading. <clears throat> this works very well everywhere, uh, apart from a singularity plane, which is in the middle of the external magnet. And so to, to, to cope with the singularities on this plane, we have added the coil that is perpendicular to, the, the field of the coil is perpendicular to the field of the external magnet. And this way we have an additional field that is always different in the singularity plane. And so this way we are able to detect uh, at one kilohertz, um, position and orientation, so six degrees of freedom uh, in a workspace that is uh, a cube 30 centimeter inside. And so this <laughs> localization technique is the core of our IP. So it's also a patent and it works extremely well. So that's, that's what we are using uh, in, in our platform. And that's what we have been using to explore different level of autonomy 
in robotic colonoscopy. First level of autonomy, robotic assistance. Uh, and so here, basically, the user is looking at the image coming from the tip of the endoscope and with the joystick is driving the tip uh, uh, with respect of the framework uh, of the camera. So forward, backward, left and right is with respect to the camera view. And then the system localizes the tip in real time and decide how to move the external magnet to implement the user intent. And so this way, uh, we did a trial with 10 users, five reps each user, and we were able to reach the end of the column in less than four minutes, 100% of the time. And so this result was really exciting for us because it's extremely comparable with conventional colonoscopy. And this tells us that uh, time will be comparable to conventional colonoscopy, so solving the problem that we had before. <clears throat> Another level of automation is task autonomy. And so again, thanks to localization, we were able to automate uh, retroflexion, for example. So retroflexion is from looking forward to looking backward. <clears throat> this is very important to find lesions behind austral folds of the colon, something that a normal conventional colonoscope cannot do because cannot really retroflect everywhere in the column can only retroflect in the first part by pushing against the, 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 uh, the rectum wall, but cannot retroflect anywhere else. Um, and so in this case, we basically uh, have a routine that autonomously track the position of the tip of the endoscope and decide how best to move the external magnet to achieve a retroflexion. Um, and then, um, another task that we are automating, and this is very recent research, is uh, uh, biopsy targeting. <clears throat> so the first step is uh, during withdrawal, so I need, probably need to, to open a parenthesis here. So in, during a colonoscopy, the gastroenterologist try to get to the end of the colon as fast as possible. And then on the way back during retrieval, the gastroenterologist look around uh, to find lesions and get biopsies or remove polyps. And so the, the, the diagnostic inspection really happened during retrieval. And so here we have implemented a routine that while we retrieve the endoscope, the external magnet follows so that we are always maintaining magnetic coupling. Then once a target is identified by an image analysis routine, um, we compute the distance from the tip of the endoscope to the target. And we do this by acquiring multiple images of the target and do a triangulation. Then once we have estimated the position, we know where the forceps would exit from the instrument channel. And the system basically align the place where the biopsy forceps will come out to the target. So what is left to the user to do is to just get the biopsy sample. So this supports basically is, is, a, is an aid to facilitate tissue biopsy. Another task we have automated is uh, ultrasound imaging with a magnetic flexible endoscope. So this is a slightly modified version of our uh, magnetic endoscope embedding also micro ultrasound transducers. And so micro ultrasound is high frequency ultrasound, so about 20 megahertz, and is able to discriminate down to a few millimeters. And so in this case, we can have an image of the inner layer of the colon mucosa and tissue. And this can tell us if there is a lesion or a cancer or something suspicious. So the idea would be if the uh, user identifies some, some uh, lesion that is suspect, then goes there instead of getting a tissue sample, goes there with the ultrasound part of the, of the endoscope and assess in situ in real time if that is a malignant lesion. Um, and so in this case, we uh, integrated these micro ultrasound transducers and defined uh, a threshold in the ultrasound signal where uh, uh, above uh, 
above, and you see here we are manipulating the, the ultrasound transducer. And if, if the ultrasound signal is above a certain threshold, that means that um, the, um, the contact is stable. And so we can progress with the scan. Uh, you see, this is the output of the ultrasound. This is the threshold that we have defined. If the ultrasound is above this threshold, then it means that we have a stable contact and we can do imaging. And you see, this is the image that was reconstructed. And so we can also maintain a stable contact uh, if in disturbance and disturbances are introduced, like in this case, this arm, human arm is introducing disturbances and we can do autonomous scanning. So first we autonomously detect the echo. Once we have a stable echo, we start autonomous scanning of, of the surface. And so in this case, <laughs> we have uh, a phantom with specific features and we were able to recreate the uh, image of the phantom. Then we brought this into um, animal trials and uh, first navigated the colon of a pig until the, the desired point. Then we tried with joystick to obtain an ultrasound scan, but we failed because we wanted to compare manual versus autonomous ultrasound scanning. Then we started the, the autonomous routine to get ultrasound scanning and we were successful in get a nice image of the bowel uh, layers. Um, then back to the autonomous, different autonomous layers, full autonomous colonoscopy. So in this case, we have a very simple image analysis routine that understand where the center of the lumen is. And so it's this uh, uh, green dot. And then once the, the routine understands where the center of the lumen is, uh, it instructs the robot to navigate forward. And so in this case, what is left to the user to do is just feed, feed the detector. And again, we repeated the experiment on a simulator and we were able to complete colonoscopies, uh, 50 colonoscopies with 10 different users in about four minutes. Um, then we moved this to animal trials and we were able to demonstrate that autonomous colonoscopy also works in vivo. And in this case, uh, uh, we were able to navigate up to 85 centimeters inside the colon of a pig <laughs> with, extreme, with an extremely convoluted anatomy, which is typical of a pig. So very three-dimensional and, and this really made us uh, proud. And we, we, we hope that in humans would be much easier because the anatomy in humans is more flat and less convoluted than in a pig. And so where are we now with this platform? We, are, uh, we have funding to do first in human trials in the UK and in the US. Um, and we want to see if with human trials, if this is safe uh, and, and start to assess pain. And then in parallel, we are extremely excited about the opportunity to merge this with artificial intelligence. So there, are, uh, there is this system here distributed by Medtronic, developed by an Italian company called Cosmo Pharmaceutical. Uh, this is FDA approved, already uh, available in hospital. And this is basically a system that thanks to AI, uh, highlights potential lesions and polyps uh, to the user. Uh, similar technology developed by a uh, startup here in the UK called Odin Medical. And I mean, integrating these capabilities to our platform would really uh, make a step forward in democratizing uh, colonoscopy to less experienced, skilled uh, users. And so widening access to high quality colonoscopy. It's also possible to go a step forward in integration of robotics and AI <clears throat> and do sort of 3D mapping um, and so something very interesting would be to reconstruct the colon the, from monocular images coming from the endoscope and understand if all the colon has been visualized or if there are blind spots. 
And this can happen really nicely with our platform because we have 3D localization that combined with monocular vision rec uh, reconstruction uh, can work very well, at least we hope. And so the goal is to have into Okay. Um, now, that's all for robotic colonoscopy. I'll now briefly touch on uh, um, these these other two uh, area of, of research, and then and then we'll go on magnetic tentacles. So very briefly, uh, in this case, we developed an ultra low cost design for a flexible endoscope. Uh, instead of board and cable driving, we have uh, three pneumatic bellows that are insufflated and deflated by three plastic syringes. Um, those three plastic syringes are connected to this uh, uh, user interface, which remind us of uh, multi-backbone uh, snake-like robots. Uh, and this was a design coming from a collaboration with Nabil Siman at Vanderbilt, uh, who is an expert in multi-backbone uh, snake robots. Um, but is in the end, this was an extremely simple and ultra low cost design. And the entire cost of this is down to plastics and the camera. So you can fabricate this for $3 if you have ultra low cost cameras. Um, and more recently, we have tried to integrate the three bellows at the tip in a monolithic design uh, to have a single component. But yeah, as I mentioned, I, I, I want to be quick on this. And if you have more questions, we can, we can uh, chat during the Q&A session. Um, also very briefly here, um, our work in uh, robotic surgery, I want to mention a review paper that we recently, re recently last year, published on uh, annual review of control robotics and autonomous system. This is uh, uh, quite long, it's 30 page, um, review paper going through the details of each level of autonomy defined for surgical robotics. And so we expand uh, and define, we provide clarification of the definition of how um, autonomy can map into surgical robotics. So if you are interested in this, I, I recommend you to check, check it out. Our specific uh, contribution to the field, <clears throat> we have been tried recently to automate the motion of the third arm of a Da Vinci robot. So of course, as you may be aware, the Da Vinci robot has four arms. One is for the camera and three for the instruments. Typically the surgeon control two instruments at a time. The third arm can be used to retract a tissue, an organ while the surgeon is operating underneath. <clears throat> and so what we have tried, we have been trying to do was to automate the motion of the retracting arm to lift the organ, depending on the motion of the two instruments that the surgeon is, is operating. We have applied uh, artificial intelligence, but also something to mention is that we have created a data set uh, <clears throat> from uh, uh, cadaveric procedures that is available now on GitHub. Um, and yeah, we have developed, we have tried different uh, architectures. So if you are interested, I recommend you to check out those, those papers. <clears throat> but now let me jump to the second part of my talk uh, about magnetic tentacles. So this is a much more uh, new stream of research for us. We started this in, uh, 2018, 20, yeah, 2018, with a large grant that I've received uh, uh, from the European Research Council. And, uh, and basically the idea is to uh, expand our knowledge about magnetic manipulation to continuum robots that have multiple magnetic element along their length. So we don't want to control just the tip anymore, but we want to control the entire shape. 
so we want to control the entire shape so that we can, for example, perform follow the leader motion inside convoluted anatomy. We can uh, stiffen the body of the tentacle and just move the tip <coughs> and so on. Um, and so of course, I mean, the, the, the magnetic manipulation and control of endoluminal devices is not new. And there are groups that are doing this uh, uh, very uh, nicely. In particular, there is uh, ETH, uh, the group of Brad Nelson, uh, the group of uh, uh, Sartak Misra at the University of Twente. Um, there is uh, Digist in Korea, uh, working with multiple magnets and the group at MIT, uh, working with polymeric uh, uh, extrusion of embedding magnetic particles. And of course, there is Eric uh, uh, at Toronto doing uh, marvelous work with wireless uh, uh, micro robots. So very nice uh, and yeah, relatively crowded field. Where we try to do something different is that we want to actuate the entire body. So multiple points, uh, in the length of a continuum robot. <clears throat> and so we started from a very simple basic problem. So assuming an homogeneous, an external homogeneous field, can we magnetize the multiple element in a continuum robot so that we can get a desired shape? And so the first step was to simulate have a simulate simulation, FEM simulation of a single element. Then we gave this, this model to an artificial neural network uh, to simulate um, how, the, how three of those elements would behave together. And then the neural network was tasked uh, uh, to tell us how we should magnetize such tentacles in order to detect, to, to obtain a certain shape under an homogeneous magnetic field. <clears throat> and so, as I was mentioning, the first step was to create a finite element model of a single element. In doing so, we also did a spin out work that was published uh, very recently on frontiers of uh, robotics and AI. And so in this spin out work, uh, we tried different uh, mechanical model uh, for uh, material uh, identification, material so for, for, finite, for finite element modeling of deflection and to identify the proper material parameters, we used uh, an artificial neural network. And uh, the results are encouraging in a sense that thanks to an evolutionary algorithm to define the model parameters, we were able to get better fitting of the finite element model. Um, and then coming back to, to the original question, the finite element model was used to, uh, to teach a neural network how different uh, uh, magnetization of three elements would uh, deflect a tentacle under a certain homogeneous field. And then the neural network told us uh, how to magnetize the tentacle to achieve a desired shape. So we had three different shapes that we wanted. We fabricated three tentacles following the same process. So uh, silicon alternated with doped silicon, doped with uh, neodymium, iron, boron particles. And then we took three samples and we magnetized them in three different trays inside the magnetizer. Uh, each of, of this tray was shaped uh, with the output of the uh, artificial neural network. And so you see here the results. So the first magnetization under the homogeneous magnetic field give us a certain shape. The second magnetization give us a different shape. 
and a third magnetization give us an, another different shape. And so this was the first step. Second question was how do we want to generate the external controlling field? And here <laughs> we tapped into a debate uh, of the, uh, in the field of uh, uh, magnetic manipulation. Should we do it with coils? Should we do it with permanent magnets? And I know Eric, Eric is a main player in this debate as well. Um, since we are experts with permanent magnets, we of course were leaning to permanent magnets. Uh, and so we tried with two permanent magnets because one would not give us the dexterity that we want. So we tried with two independent permanent magnets manipulated by two robotic arms. Well, what are the advantages? So the advantages are a much more flexible workspace than the workspace you would have with coils. The magnetic power density is higher for permanent magnets. So uh, basically, given the magnetic field and, and field gradient that we want, uh, we can obtain it with a smaller permanent magnet rather than a larger coil. Um, of course, there are downsides. For example, we cannot switch off a permanent magnet. Uh, we cannot control the magnetic field intensity by controlling the current as in a coil. So it's always a trade-off uh, and it's, it's a lively debate. Um, but yeah, we, we, our contribution is trying to show what can be done with two independent, uh, independently controlled uh, uh, magnets. And so we have a publication at Iros where we try to demonstrate, uh, uh, following a work uh, from Eric that demonstrated that this is possible, that it's possible to control eight degrees of freedom. Uh, in a thing, um, we, we tried here to, to replicate the experiment with two permanent uh, uh, magnets. And we are still working on this. And this is basically the platform that we are using for, for our work at the moment. <clears throat> then we wanted to implement a follow the leader motion. Um, and so how to change the external field and, and field gradient, uh, at, at the moment, just the field and in future also the field gradient, while introducing the tentacle with an introducer in order to avoid specific obstacles. So here we publish a work in just reporting simulation results at ISMR last year. Um, but now we are progressing the work and we have a paper under review for soft robotics where we, first step is uh, we, try to understand how a proper magnetization can help us in obtaining a desired shape. For example, this sample here has only a tip magnetization. So only this segment is magnetized. This sample here has uniform magnetization. So each of the three elements is magnetized in the same way. Well, this one has an optimal magnetization. What we want to do is to go around this shape. Now I'll show you the video. And so you see the first type and up touching the obstacle. The second type with axial magnetization again, end up touching the obstacle. The third type, which is the, the optimal, you see it has a twist at the beginning and I'll come back to twisting later, but then is able to shape form <clears throat> in the shape that we desired, which is this one here. <clears throat> and so first we demonstrated how important is proper tentacle uh, magnetization. And then we repeated the experiment that I showed you in simulation earlier. So we started with tip only magnetization and we see that we have several contact, several instances of contact during introduction. And here the target is to reach this pin here. Uh, then with axial magnetization, again, we have several instances of undesired contact. And let me go faster here, but you see it's, it's, it's not ideal. And then the last is 
is the optimized magnetization where we have uh, uh, predicted how to magnetize the tentacle and then also how to move the external magnets, so how to change the magnetic field and field gradient uh, while introducing the tentacle to perform a sort of follow the leader path. And then the next step is, of course, to <clears throat> try this in a clinical application. So the first clinical application we tried was bronchoscopy. So bronchoscopy is, I mean, the, the goal is to get to peripheral area of, of the lungs, eventually to get biopsy of peripheral lung tumors. Um, so a bronch, this is usually done by bronch, bronchoscopy, Bronchoscope is a flexible endoscope, typically four millimeter in diameter. Uh, four millimeter in diameter can only reach down to the second or third generation of bronchi. You may be aware that companies like Intuitive and J&J &J have introduced robotic platform for bronchoscopy. They are also four millimeter, the J&J &J platform, and 3.5 millimeter, the Intuitive platform. And so despite they being robotic, very nice platforms, they can only reach a limited, an extremely limited um, section, percentage of the bronchi. With our tentacles, we are down to two millimeters. With two millimeters, you can really go deep inside the bronchi to peripheral areas and make a difference. So as you can see, the size doesn't really scale linearly, but it scales logarithmically with size, with, with diameter. Uh, and so we are really, uh, our goal is really to, to, to maximize the area that we can reach by scaling down the dimension to two millimeters in diameter. <laughs> and so we started from a CT scan of the bronchi, and then we decided uh, three targets. Uh, and so here we, we want to reach three different uh, targets, target A, target B, and target C. Then we gave this trajectory to our algorithm that generated us three different magnetization, and so three different tentacles, and three different sequences of actuation for the external magnets. And so here you see the tentacle is here, and as we keep introducing, we also move the external magnet uh, in order for the tentacle to get to the right, to the right spot. Uh, and this is to get to uh, position A, and then we change tentacle and uh, we try to get to uh, point B that is up here, basically. And so this, this needs a pretty, sharp band, uh, convoluted anatomy. So you see now the tentacle is coming here. And so now we, we move the external magnet in order to, to have this sort of uh, very uh, sharp band. And now the, the tentacle is progressing up to the, up to the point. And, uh, and of course we do not have uh, any substantial stiff, stiff component inside the tent because it's extremely flexible. <clears throat> now, these are results of last week. So <laughs> extremely recent. Um, in this case, let me stop it for a second. So in this case, we have integrated the fiber bracket grating sensor inside the tentacle. So now we are able to detect the shape in real time and we can do closed loop control of um, tentacle navigation. So in this first example, we have a bronchos. So in this example, the bronchoscope is, the tentacle is coming out from the instrument channel of the bronchoscope. So basically we get to as far as possible with the bronchoscope. Once we are there, the tentacle comes out from the instrument channel and progress where for, further where the bronchoscope would not, would not have the space to. So in this case, the first example, the target is here. The bronchoscope is here. And I'll now play the video. And we have different uh, 
views of this experiment. So this is the view from the bronchoscope and you see the tentacle is coming out from, uh, uh, from the bronchoscope. Then we have another view from here. And, uh, and this is the view for, from a camera. And then you see here the tentacle that is navigating into the branch from the right to the left. Here we also have a bottom view. And again, you see the tentacle trying to reach the target. Um, so this is the example of going to that branch. And then soon there we have another example. <clears throat> and so in this case, we do not have, so this is a different path. So he, this time the target is here and the bronchoscope is here. And you see, this is the view from here. And you see that the tentacle is, is navigating to the right uh, pathway. So in this case, I was saying that uh, we were able to navigate different pathways with a single magnetization. So we have optimized and we optimize and further our algorithm. And so we are able to generate a magnetization that would enable multiple branches to be navigated. And again, we try to do follow the leader motion, we try to interact with the, with the surrounding tissue as less as possible. So not relying on pushing on the anatomy to progress like tip driven uh, flex endoluminal devices. <clears throat> Where are we now with this? This week we are doing cadaver triads. So basically we have uh, cadaveric lungs uh, under fluoroscopy uh, to perform navigation. Uh, and uh, I was planning to, to go to the cadaver lab today, but unfortunately I didn't feel very well, but I'm hop hopeful to go tomorrow. Um, now, some, some side, let me see how much time, yeah. Um, very quickly, some side effect that we have observed, uh, for example, an unexpected problem is twisting. Um, so you can see here that uh, in, the in the first part of the motion, we have undesired twisting around the main axis of the tentacle. Um, you can see it again here. So this is a ten magnetized tentacle. If you increase the field in one direction, you have motion that is fine. <clears throat> but if, if you increase the, 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 the field in the other direction, you see you have a twisting uh, of the tentacle first. And this may be undesired depending on the application. Um, and so you see here, we first simulated what was going on. This is published in another paper on Frontiers in Robotics and AI. And you see this is the potentially unstable actuation where twisting occur before shape forming. Uh, we try to cope with this by introducing fiber reinforcement. Uh, so we have uh, um, helical fibers running through the length of the tentacle. This is a larger tentacle. This is six millimeter in diameter. And you see the, the uh, now the, the, the twisting effect is, is reduced. Of course, the twisting effect can also avo be avoided by planning of how we change the magnetic field. But I mean, that's something we are still exploring. Uh, but we, we were curious to see how much, uh, uh, how much fiber reinforcement would help. Of course, fiber reinforcement make the tentacle stiffer. So maybe undesirable in, in certain application. Um, now to conclude, uh, um, we are now doing uh, cadaveric bronchoscopy, actually this week, uh, fingers crossed that everything goes well. Um, it would be interesting to find all, try other type of mechanical constraint for smaller tentacles. Um, mechanical constraint, I mean shape. So maybe we can shape the tentacle itself instead of just a cylinder we can have mechanical feature to prevent the tentacle uh, from performing certain undesired motions. We are interested in uh, improving our uh, fabrication techniques, especially we are collaborating with the group of Ras Harris, a professor in mechanical engineering at the University of Leeds. 
we are exploring aerosol jet aerosol uh, um, jet printing to print magnetic tentacle that have a diameter below the millimeter. Um, well, and that's it really. Um, before concluding, let me point out that uh, um, uh, you kindly invited me to uh, give a plenary talk at ICRA in 2021. That talk was different from this one. I talk about the, the, the 10 year, past 10 years of research in medical capsule robots. So if you want to check it out, I think is 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 more like sort of review kind of talk than uh, and, and so it, it may be of interest to some of you. It's available on from my website uh, as well as from the YouTube uh, Itapolis Ro Robotic and Automation Society channel. And of course, I would like to ask to uh, acknowledge and thank all the uh, funding agency that supported my work, uh, the industrial collaborators, and last but not least, of course, uh, my team at the University of Leeds. And with this, I'll be more than happy to uh, get answer questions. Thank you. Wonderful, Pietro. Another wonderful talk. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I think I'll leave more time to students. Kimberly, you can go ahead to coordinate. Thank you. All right. Anybody have questions? Please feel free to um, either raise your hands or put them in the chat. Uh, Eric, it looks like we you got the first question slot. Uh, hi. Uh, great talk. Hi. I was wondering, um, you presented a lot of tethered solutions uh, here. Yeah. I was wondering whether you were researching on untethered solutions as well, and whether you see that uh, replacing uh, tethered uh, solutions in the future. Yeah, so it's a very good question. But basically, I should have presented this talk uh, in this slide. So this talk here about medical capsule robots starts exactly from wireless technology. So it, it talks about all the efforts that we started inspired by the, give, uh, the given imaging PILCAM, trying to have, add wireless robotic technologies to, to, that, to that device. Um, and so I spent about 10 years of my research trying to do wireless capsule robots. And I personally got frustrated because there are so many constraints in terms of power and size. Uh, so you have to reconcile high power expenditure of onboard actuators uh, with minimal space available for power uh, sources or battery, wireless powering and all these kind of things. So I've, I've, I've explored this a lot, uh, frankly got kind of bored about that and be very happy to reintroduce a tether so that we can have uh, energy, we can have access for instruments, we can retrieve it in case something goes wrong. And for me, this has been the best way to move, to move my research to closer to the passion, closer to translation. So with this being said, I'm part also of a European project where we try to, to make uh, wireless micro ultrasound magnetic capsule for the small bowel. Uh, but still, I think even if the technology progressed, we are still, it's still very difficult to either wireless transfer or use a power source that is enough to provide you high quality images, high speed telemetry, and also energy for a source of actuation. I think it's still a nightmare. So but hopefully the, the future generation will solve it. Okay, so he's he's given you a list students to work on. Um, Mert, you had a question? Yes, thanks. Uh, great presentation. Just a quick question. Uh, I'm also familiar with the tentacle robotics as they're also commonly used in warehousing industry for handling of different products. Um, I just wanted to understand in the future phase, let's say if these robots were to be utilized in a, uh, in a surgical environment, how would the, what would the spatial orientation of the arms in, in relation to the patient would look like? Uh, because it, it looks like they really need that 360 degree rotation around in order to navigate. 
Um, just just a hypothetical question at this point, but I uh, was just curious. That's a, that's a good question. So I was recently, uh, recently like fr last Friday, I was in a PhD panel for a student uh, from Brad Nelson group. Uh, and they just developed the coil system with three planar coil, basically sitting behind the head of the passion at the end of the surgical bed. Mm -hmm. And with this three planar coil, they were still able to control field in a three-dimensional three shape for neurovascular application. So with coils, you can also have like a flat system. With permanent magnet, you still need some clearance uh, to move the magnets around. Of course, the extreme example is an MRI machine. Yeah. Everything, and an MRI machine is, accept, is accepted in clinical uh, practice. So anything less than an MRI machine would work, but yeah, there are a lot of grades there. Yeah, I guess you. it depends a lot on the application and where you are. For example, there are so magnetic solutions for guiding cochlear implants inside the ear. So in that case, the magnet will just be around here. So it, it really depends. It's an open research field. Thanks. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, now, are you have your next? Uh, hi, thank you so much for your presentation. It was a great talk. Um, I just had a question out of curiosity. Uh, you mentioned that the magnetic flexible um, endoscopy for collectoral cancer was low cost. Um, however, I was just thinking, wouldn't the um, um, external permanent magnets increase the cost of the whole device? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a good question. So in terms of business model, let's say, there would be a one-off cost, which is the cost of the entire platform. And then the cost per procedure, that would be extremely small because that is only the cost of the disposable device. And so you can envisage uh, uh, endoscopy clinics doing uh, an investment, which is in the same order of magnitude of buying uh, a standard flexible endoscope. Uh, but then the, the, the cost per procedure would be much reduced because uh, uh, we can make the flexible endoscope single use uh, um, at a much lower cost of reprocessing a flexible endoscope. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Diana, you had a question. Yes, hi, I did. Um, I was just wondering when you were talking a bit about surgical uh, robots. So I know that with anything autonomous, there's a lot of ethical concerns. And I know that in med, like med tech development, it already takes a long time. I know some FDA processes take like 10 years to complete. So having the burden of like going through the med tech world, and then also the automation, how, how big of a time you know time limitation is there because of the automation and all these ethical concerns that you kind of have to work your way around when you're developing uh, medical yeah. robotics so that's a very good question and it depends on the application i can give you a very concrete uh, specific example with a robotic colonoscopy platform so there we have uh, demonstrated that however you control the platform there is no way you can arm the patient because um, the magnetic field is, is strong enough to move the tip. But if you get the tip and you put in close contact with the external magnet, the force in between the two, the magnetic force in between the two is not enough to create any damage to the tissue. And so by design, the platform is safe. Whatever type of autonomy or whatever type of control you are using. Um, being a, an inherently safe platform that shift the burden from the software. And so basically either, either we control it in teleoperation or autonomously, it is safe. And so taking this approach, we hope that FDA will, will 
see favorably our application. It's true that um, there are also strategies to approach the FDA. So as far as I know, there is the FDA division of surgical robotics, which is very, very difficult to navigate, uh, while the gastroenterology um, branch of the FDA is more open to innovation. So they have cleared uh, already two robotic platform for gastrointestinal endoscopy. So that can also be, there is also the, the component of strategy really. But again, I think the key is if possible to demonstrate that you are inherently safe. Of course, if that is possible, an interventional surgical robot uh, may not be able to do that by definition, so. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mira, you have a question. Yes, so I was looking into the neural networks uh, for the magnetic tentacle robots. And I wasn't, I, I wanted to know how the finding the uh, dominant mode. So like these, the artificial intelligence, how does it really help build the robots? Okay, so in, in, uh, uh, there are several ways. Uh, um, so we have a very simple use of uh, uh, AI algorithm to find the center of the lumen. So basically we train the algorithm with shapes of colon telling uh, that the lumen is the center of the dark, uh, the dark area. Um, and so in that case, the algorithm tell us where the center is and we give this information to the control system to propel the tip forward. Uh, by magnetic manipulation. So this is one example. Um, this, if I go back, let me go back to my presentation. This uh, system here, uh, you see now, this one. Okay. This system here from, uh, uh, yeah. the system here from, Metronic uh, and this system from Odin, they basically use, they train artificial intelligence with annotated, uh, uh, e, annotated endoscopy videos from normal colonoscopies, instructing them where there is a lesion, where there is a cancer, where there is no cancer and so on. And so if you train those artificial neural network, they can spot potential lesion that are not really visible to the naked eye. And so in this case, you can improve the adenoma detection rate. <laughs> and these are already on the market. So they can sp spot lesions that uh, are difficult to see, as well as if you zoom in into a lesion, this software can tell you if the lesion has the potential to be malignant, so you can you have to remove it or not. So it's not just finding, but also providing you an information on the stage of the lesion, so staging of the lesion. So it's also like a diagnostic output, really. And this is already FDA approved, is already commercially available. Something else is this 3D reconstruction. So basically for monocular image, from monocular imaging, reconstruct the shape of the column. And again, this can be done by an AI algorithm, train on real endoscopies, simulated endoscopies and so on. And this can give you a 3D, a 3D reconstruction of the column. Does this answer your question? These are just three examples, but I guess there may be many, many more uh, examples of how AI can improve. Uh, so I guess like to reconstruct the bowel, yeah. like um, the mm -hmm. artificial intelligence uh, algorithm, it, uh, it detects the location of the bowel. Um, I, I'm so it's basically yeah. trying to reconstruct the shape from motion. <clears throat> so in a frame, you have certain features. Oh. So in the next frame, those features have moved. 
and then you can reconstruct uh, from the motion the shape. Now, if you don't have any localization information, you need a lot of artificial intelligence contribution, a lot of training, uh, because you don't have the information bit that need to be reconstructed by AI. With our technology, we have that bit of information thanks to localization. So the artificial intelligence component would be would have much more a much richer input than conventional colonoscopy. So it should be able to do a better job. Oh uh, yes, thank you. It answers my question. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, we had a question uh, from a viewer in the States who is watching on YouTube, Erkin. He asks, have you shared the navigation data of the capsule robot on an online platform? Yes. Uh, so we have some shared data from our nature machine intelligence paper. So let's see, we go back. So if you go to, if you check out this paper here on natural machine intelligence, uh, we have shared some, we have, a, we have a data set shared there. Great, that's wonderful, thank you. Uh, Cameron, you have a question. Hi, Dr. Valdostri, uh, thanks for your talk, uh, wonderful as always. Um, I was wondering, I think you kind of hinted at this in a previous answer to a question about um, interventional um, sort of operations with, with magnetic devices, where you're saying that, that uh, these devices can be made inherently safe, but of course, you know, in some cases you might want to cause an intentional damage to tissue, such as for yeah. surgery. So um, is that the intention for your um, tentacle robots that they would be able to do some kind of intervention like biopsy? Um, do you see that as a major challenge? Yeah, so that's a good question. So in in, uh, in bronchoscopy, at the moment, we have an optical fiber that can deliver laser energy for abla tissue ablation. Uh, and we also have a version with the one millimeter channel to get biopsies. Um, so yeah, that, that's would that would be the idea in in that case of course the path to fda approval would be much longer um, but we'll still have a predicate device and the predicate device is the normal bronchoscope where you have anyway the the, the, the possibility of passing a biopsy needle for uh, for biopsy i think having a predicate device uh, is, is helpful the alternative to that, if you don't have a predicate device, is a de novo submission to FDA, which yeah, it may take long. Uh, my, so my experience, I can, I can certainly tell, tell this. My experience is that approaching regulatory approval is better from a company <clears throat> with appropriate investor funding rather than from a university. Approaching that from a university without a quality insurance system in place, uh, uh, with us having to learn all the process uh, has been, we have learned a lot, uh, but it's not efficient. Um, and so I, I would say what I've learned in these last five years is probably try to be more energetic in convincing investor in invest in a startup. Because my, my thought has been, I first need to get to, as, a, as an academic, I first need to get to first in human trial, and then I will license my technology. If you get to first in human trial and that goes well, someone will license your technology, but it's a nightmare to get there. And in the end, you can convince investors to invest uh, uh, even before to the, you get to first in human trial. So it, it's a balance, it's a trade-off. Uh, I've learned a lot in these last five years, so I cannot uh, say I would not do it again. But if I have to redo it now that I have learned, probably I will push more on phantom cadaveric animal trials, find investor, and then do approach regulatory approval from a company. 
Okay, good advice. Thank you. Um, we have time for just a couple of more questions. If anybody's got something to say, please raise your hand or put that message in the chat. Uh, Chen Young. Oh, he's there. You go. Um, hi, Professor Red Um, hi. Yeah, very uh wonderful uh talk and. Uh, I want to ask a few questions about your last section, uh, the magnetic and tentile uh, robots. So I noticed that you uh, did uh, many experiments uh, to, to, to verify the 2D motion of the uh, catheter. So have you done or consider any uh, 3D spatial uh, uh, experiment to validate the motion of the catheter? And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, second question. Uh, I noticed you embedded three magnets inside the canister. So I wonder why uh, the number is three. How you consider to uh, like embed more magnets to control like more uh, torture shape of the canister? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a very good question. Now, as a matter of fact, uh, um, we have transitioned from three. So we have transitioned from three magnets. Uh, oh, let me surprise, this one is the best slide. So we started from three magnets or three section with magnetic uh, particles and a 2D motion as a starting point. But then in this latest video that I'm showing here, here we are doing 3D motion with a tentacle that has a continuous magnetization. So the entire tentacle is magnetic and all the body is magnetized. So is, is, we are going basically from a dis, discrete magnetization to continuum magnetization. And this also is capable of moving in 3D. Uh, it has been a step-by-step -step process and uh, we haven't yet published this also because he's a PhD student that is finishing now, uh, is rushing to get all the results. Um, he has already got his job uh, starting in April. So he's, he hasn't had time to rationalize all the output, but they will come in time. Uh, and Eric is in the PhD committee of this uh, student. So he will, he will know directly from him, but, the, the rest of us, I, mean, I, I guess I'll, I'll know before, but the, 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 for the audits, we'll, we'll have to wait for the papers to come out. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, it looks very promising. I mean, this is a very, also a pioneering work. Uh, yeah, following, following questions, uh, this is some minor questions. So can you consider, I noticed that you embedded the, the magnet inside of the tube or the catheter. So uh, about the application, so if we, we know that if we want to do some surgical uh, operation, the tube, in the inner tube, in it need to leave the space for some instruments, for example, yeah. the interscope camera or for tape. So after embedded the, the magnet inside the channel, so I guess there's no room for the, for install the instruments, so can you, any so the, yeah, no. These these tentacles here, uh, they they can be fabricated with an hollow lumen inside. Um, for example, this has an hollow lumen inside, but also uh, this is six millimeter, but also the small one. So the, the the one we are using here is two millimeters, but it has a lumen in the middle that is one millimeter, and that can be used for uh, optical fiber or it can be used for uh, a biopsy needle. Uh, if we increase the size to I mean, six millimeter, for example, we can also have a camera. Um, at the moment, we are also working on two collaborative uh, uh, tentacle robots. So one can have a camera and the other one can have a, a laser light uh, to work together. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. One last question from Ramal. 
Uh, hi. Hi, Professor. Thank you for your talk again. Um, so I had a question about uh, the feasibility of using magnet control robots in viscous fluids. Um, mm. For example, um, one example I can think off the top of my head is when people have blocked and inflamed veins, and these usually mm. show up at the surface of the skin. Um, what they do is they inject the fluid and end up killing the vein. Would it be possible to use uh, micro flexible robots to get in there, uh, be injected in the vein, be controlled in a viscous fluid like the blood and remove such a blockage? Okay, yes. So uh, that's a good, very good question. So we, when, when we were thinking uh, about magnetic tentacles, uh, so for us, it's such a new, a new technology that we are very much unsure which is the best clinical application. So it's one of those that is a te technology pool rather than a clinical, uh, uh, clinical need. Um, so we are still, we, we have considered different applications. We have also considered cardiovascular applications. So moving, <clears throat> accessing uh, from the femoral artery and navigate the catheter, uh, the, the magnetic catheter uh, through, the, through the vein. Um, I think uh, that, that, I mean, looking at standard catheters, uh, we can make magnetic tentacles that are very similar and control the entire shape so that we don't need to push against the uh, anatomy to, to navigate convoluted uh, bands. Uh, that would be the advantage of controlling the entire shape. In that case, we may have to control different points on a very long uh, segment of the catheter. I don't see any particular issue in controlling uh, this into a fluid, uh, because in the end, uh, we can apply the same forces and torques uh, of um, a stand conventional and luminal device such as a catheter. Um, so the group at MIT is working on neurovascular application and they have a very similar silicon based uh, um, and the luminal device with magnetic particles. They only control the tip in that case uh, and they only control the orientation of the tip while they are pushing. Uh, but yeah, they move in, in fluid uh, and looks like it's working. But yeah, I mean, no, no, quick. It, it's something that we, we hopefully we will try after we have uh, finished with bronchoscopy. We are really keen to, to apply this technology to as many applications as possible and see what works and what not. For some application, it may just not, not be ideal at all. Okay, a quick follow-up. Have you noticed a lower, um, lower bound on the amount of control you can have of, on these um, tentacle magnetic robots? For example, how tightly of a maze can they go through? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good question. So first we notice <clears throat> some unwanted, undesired effect like the twisting, which we, we, we really, I mean, it was kind of unexpected and interesting. Um, in terms of uh, how tight uh, the bands, uh, well, they can do very, very sharp bands. Um, I think the main point is if you want to do follow the leader, uh, control. So in that case, we are, we show that we can control eight degrees of freedom or independently. And so we have to live with those eight degrees of freedom, I guess. Thank you. All Great. Right. Um, well, Dr. Valdastri, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, thank you everyone for your great questions. Uh, and we'll see you next time. Yes, you, thank you. you. Well, uh, thank you again for giving the thank wonderful you. talk. And uh, I hope you are impressed by how enthusiastic our students are. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, very impressed, very impressed. Yes, yes, yes. If you teach yeah, on our to campus, they will not much. let it go easily. 
<laughs> uh, are you are you are, are classes back in person at the moment or still online? Next Monday, back to classroom. I look forward to that. I hope you recover very quickly, Pietro. Thank you. Thank you Thank again. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.